Dante in the Woods, The Three Beasts and Meeting Virgil. In the middle of the journey of our life, I came to myself in a dark wood, for the straight way was lost. But when I had reached the foot of a hill where the valley ended that had pierced my heart with fear, I looked on high and saw its shoulders clothed already with the rays of the planet that leads us straight on every path. And behold, almost at the beginning of the steep, a leopard, light and very swift, covered with spotted fur. But not so that I did not fear the sight of a lion that appeared to me. He appeared to be coming against me, with his head high and with raging hunger, so that the air appeared to tremble at him. And a she-wolf, that seemed laden with all cravings in her leanness, and has caused many people to live in wretchedness. While I was falling down into a low place, before my eyes, one had offered himself to me, who, through long silence, seemed hoarse. Now, are you that Virgil, that fountain which spreads forth so broad a river of speech? Dante and Virgil walking towards the gate of hell. And like one who unwills what he just now willed, and with new thoughts changes his intent so that he draws back entirely from beginning, so did I become on that dark slope for thinking I gave up the undertaking that I had been so quick to begin. I am Beatrice, who calls you to go. I come from the place where I long to return. Love moved me and makes me speak. O oh, full of pity, she who helped me, and you, courteous, who have quickly obeyed the true words she offered you. Your words have so filled my heart with desire to come with you that I have returned to my first purpose. Dante and Virgil at the entrance to hell, Acheron and Charon's boat. Through me the way into the grieving city, through me the way into eternal sorrow, through me the way among the lost people. Abandon every hope, you who enter. These words I saw written with dark colour above a gate. After I had recognised several, I saw and knew the shade of him who in his cowardice made the great refusal. And behold, coming toward us, in a boat, an old man, white with the hairs of age, crying, Woe to you, wicked souls! And my leader to him, Sharon, do not torture yourself with anger. This is willed where what is willed can be done, so ask no more. Charon, the demon, with eyes like glowing coals, making signs to them, gathers them all in. He beats with his oar whoever lingers. Dante awakening and discoursing with ancient sages and warriors in limbo.
When the voice had ceased and was silent, I saw four great shades coming toward us. Their expression was neither sad nor happy. My good master began to speak. Behold the one with that sword in his hand coming in front of the other three as if their lord. That is Homer, the supreme poet. The next is Horace, the satirist. Ovid is the third and the last Lucan. We came to the foot of a noble castle, seven times encircled by high walls, defended all around by a lovely little stream. This we passed over like solid ground, through seven gates I entered with these sages. We came into a meadow of fresh green. Minos the Judge and the Punishment of Lust There stands Minos, bristling and snarling. He examines the soul's guilt at the entrance. He judges and passes sentence by how he raps. The infernal whirlwind, which never rests, drives the spirits before its violence. Turning and striking, it tortures them. After I had heard my teacher name the ancient ladies and knights, pity came upon me, and I was almost lost. I began, Poet, gladly would I speak with those two who go together and seem to be so light upon the wind. Cerberus and the Punishment of Gluttony Great hailstones, filthy water and snow pour down through the dark air. The earth stinks that receives them. When Cerberus, the great worm, caught sight of us, he opened his mouths and showed his fangs, not one of his members held still. We were passing through the shades that the heavy rain weighs down, and we were placing our souls on their emptiness that seems a human body. They were lying on the ground, all of them save one, who raised himself to sit as soon as he saw us passing before him. Plutus and the Punishment of Avarice and Waste Pape Satan, Pape Satan Alepe, began Plutus with his clucking voice, and that noble sage who knew all things. Here I saw people more numerous than before, on one side and the other, with great cries rolling weights by the force of their chests. These were clerics who have no hairy covering to their heads, and popes and cardinals in whom avarice does its worst. the Styx, the boat of Phlegius, and the city of Dis. I say, continuing, that well before we reached the foot of the high tower, our eyes went up to its summit, because of two small flames we saw placed there and another replying from so far away that the eye could hardly seize it. A bowstring never propelled an arrow to fly through the air so swiftly as a little boat I saw come toward us in that instant over the water. Governed by a single oarsman who was shouting, Now you are caught, wicked soul! 
Phlegias, Phlegias, you are shouting uselessly, said my lord. This time you will have us no longer than passing over the bog. As soon as my leader and I were in the bark, the ancient prow set forth, cutting more of the water than it does with others. While we were coursing the dead channel, before me rose up one covered with mud, who said, Who are you, who come before your hour? My good master said, Now, my son, we approach the city whose name is Dis, with the weighty citizens, the great host. The Styx and the city of Dis, the Furies, Medusa, and the Celestial Messenger. Look, he told me, at the ferocious Erinius. This is Megera on the left. She who weeps on the right there is Electo. Tsiphony is in the middle, and he fell silent. Let Medusa come, so we will turn him to concrete, they were all saying, looking down. We did ill in not avenging on Theseus his attack. Turn around and keep your eyes closed, for if the Gorgon appears and you should see her, there would never be any going back up. So spoke my master, and he himself turned me, and he did not stop with my hands, but closed me up with his own as well. So saw I more than a thousand shattered souls fleeing before one who was walking across sticks with dry feet. Well did I perceive that he was sent from heaven. Ah, how full of disdain he seemed to me. He came to the gate and with a little wand he opened it, for nothing held it. the city of Dis and the punishment of heresy. O Tuscan, who through the city of fire, alive, walk along speaking so modestly, let it please you to stop in this place. Your speech makes you manifest as native of that noble fatherland to which perhaps I was too harmful. Suddenly, this sound came forth from one of the arcs. Therefore, I shrank, afraid, somewhat closer to my leader. And he said, Turn, what are you doing? See there Farinata, who has stood erect. From the waist up, you will see all of him. Then he moved his foot toward the left. We turned from the wall and walked toward the centre along a path that cut straight to a valley whose stench was displeasing even up there. Refuge beside the tomb of Pope Anastasius. At the edge of a high cliff, made by great rocks broken in a circle, we came above a crueler crowd. And there, because of the horrible excess of stench cast up by the abyss, we moved back beside the lid of a great tomb, where I saw writing which said, I hold Pope Anastasius, whom Photius drew from the straight away. the centaurs and the punishment of murder. I saw an ample curving ditch that embraces the entire plain according to what my guide had said. And between the foot of the cliff and it, centaurs were running in file, armed with arrows as they used to go hunting in the world.
the harpies and the wood of suicides. Not green leaves, but dark in colour. Not smooth branches, but knotted and twisted. No fruit was there, but thorns with poison. There the ugly harpies made their nests, who drove the Trojans from Strafordes with dire prophecy of their future woe. Their wings were broad, their necks and faces human, their feet have claws, and their great bellies are feathered. They utter laments on the strange trees. Behind them, the wood was full of black bitches, ravenous and running like greyhounds loosed from the chain. They set their teeth to the one that had squatted, tearing him to pieces. Bit by bit, they carried off those suffering members. My guide then took me by the hand and led me to the bush that wept through its bleeding wounds in vain. The Reign of Fire, Punishment for Blasphemy. To make the new things clearly manifest, I say that we arrived at a plain that removes every plant from its bed. Of naked souls I saw many flocks, all weeping wretchedly, and different laws seemed to govern them. Some were lying supine on the earth, some were sitting all huddled, and some were walking ceaselessly. Who is that great one who seems not to mind the fire and lies there scornful and frowning so that the rain does not seem to ripen him? This was one of the seven kings who besieged Thebes, and he had and seems still to have God in disdain and respects him little, but as I said, his spite is the ornament his breast deserves. The Banks of the Flegeton and the Punishment of Sodomy, the Dialogue with Brunetto Latini. Now one of the hand margins carries us along and the vapour from the river give us shelter that protects the water and the banks from the fire. We encountered a band of souls coming along the barrier and each was gazing at us in the evening. People gaze at one another under the new moon. Looked over in this way by such a company I was recognised by one who seized me by the hem and cried, What a marvel! And I, when he stretched out his arm toward me, penetrated with my eyes' baked appearance so that his scorched face did not prevent my intellect from recognising him and reaching my hand down towards his face, I replied, Are you there, Brunetto? Talking with Guido Guerra, Tigayo Aldobrandi and Jacopo Rusticucci and throwing the cord into Gerione's pit. Three shades came running together out of a herd passing by beneath the rain of the harsh punishment. I had a cord girding me and with it I had thought at times to capture the leopard with the spotted hide. After I had untied it from around me as my leader had commanded me, I held it out to him, knotted and wound, and he turned toward his right side and somewhat far from the bank threw it down into that deep pit. It's 
Virgilio mounts Gerion while Dante talks with the usurers. Behold the beast with pointed tail that passes through the mountains and pierces walls and armour. Behold the one that makes the whole world stink. So my leader began speaking to me, and he gestured to it to come ashore near the end of our marble pathway. And that filthy image of fraud came over and beached its head and chest, but did not draw up its tail as far as the bank. Its face was that of a just man. So kindly seemed its outer skin, and the rest of its torso was that of a serpent. It had two paws, hairy to the armpits. It had back and breasts, and both sides painted with knots and little wheels. And when we had reached it, a little further, on the sand, I see people sitting near the empty place. So once more, along the outer edge of that seventh circle, I walked all alone, where the mournful people were sitting. When I turned my eyes to their faces, on which the painful fire falls down, I recognised none. But I perceived that from the neck of each hung a bag of special colour, with a special emblem, and their eyes seemed to feed there. And as I come gazing among them, on a yellow purse I saw blue that had the shape and bearing of a lion. Then, proceeding further with my scrutiny, I saw another, red as blood, displaying a goose, whiter than butter. Gerion's arrival in the Malibolgia, the punishment of pandering and flattery. There is in hell a place called Malibolgia, made of scone, the colour of iron, like the circle that encloses it. In the exact centre of the evil field, there gapes a broad, deep pit. As where to guard the walls, many moats, gird castles, their placing traces a pattern. Such an image these valleys made there and, as from the thresholds of such fortresses, bridges lead to the outside bank. On my right hand I saw new cause of pity, new torments and new wielders of the whip, of which the first pocket was full. At the bottom were the sinners, naked. On this side of the midpoint they came with their faces toward us, on the other side, they went with us, but with longer steps. Here and there along the dark rock, I saw horned demons with great whips who were beating them from behind. Simoniac's Flaming Holes I saw along the sides and the bottom the livid rock perforated with holes, all of the same size, and each was round. From the mouth of each protruded the feet and legs of a sinner, as far as the thighs, and the rest was inside. All of them had both soles aflame, therefore they wriggled their joints so violently that they would have broken twisted witches or braided ropes. Therefore with both arms he seized me, and when he had lifted me up to his breast, he climbed back up by the way he had come down. 